Okay, so uh, one of the things that we're really passionate about here at LifePoint is encouraging one another to be all that we can be. And this encouragement is necessary, I think, because each and every one of us is capable of being so much more than what we've settled for. And so for a few weeks in church, we're talking about, uh, um, about more. And in talking about this, what we're saying is that second best and plodding along and living half a life isn't good enough in our businesses, in our relationships, in our health, in our aspiration to follow Jesus through this life, we are capable of being so much more than what we've currently settled for. Last week I introduced you to a really interesting character in the Bible called Elisha. Uh, his story comes from, from the Book of Kings, which is the biblical version of Game of Thrones. That's a spoiler for a series I'm working on. And um, this, this morning's episode comes from the second book of the Kings, chapter 3 and verse 9. Now, a lot of what we're going to read through together this morning is Old Testament weird, freaky, strange stuff. But uh, don't worry, I'll walk you through it, I'll, I'll explain what it all means, and then at the very end we'll tie it all together and we'll try and land it somewhere in your life and in my life. Okay, let me just adjust this a bit higher, and um, there we go. Okay, so uh, 2 Kings chapter 3 and verse 9, we read that the king of Israel set out with the king of Judah and the king of Edom. So in this sentence, you've got three kings who are in an alliance, and the key point being made is that they've set out. What they've set out for is war, and where they've set out to is the desert. And the enthusiasm with which they set out for war is quickly overtaken by the dry, dusty, deadly realities of life in the desert. When the writer of this sentence says that uh, after a roundabout march of seven days, the army had no more water, he's using the word seven in its biblical symbolic sense of perfect or complete. So what he's saying is that this army didn't march from point A to point B by the most direct route, not at all. This army did what all armies in the desert do. They marched from water source to water source to water source to water source. And in using this number seven, what he's saying is that they did this march perfectly. They knew exactly where the water sources were. They knew exactly where, where, where water was to be found. And insofar as their search for this water was perfect and resulted for nothing, that therefore means that they are now most perfectly screwed. So no longer are their minds filled with war and the treasures it will bring. Now every parched thought in their slowly swelling brains is of water and the avoidance of death. And when they're in that place where they've realized that it's all going horribly wrong, they then do what you and I do when we realize that it's all going horribly wrong. They ask, why? And so in the next sentence, we read that the king of Israel says, what? Now the word what there means, what? What? What happened? We had a plan, and our plan was perfect. We were going to set out for war, and we were going to go from water source to water source to water source, and then we were going to fight the bad guys, beat the bad guys, take all their stuff, come home with all their stuff, and poets and songwriters would, would tell tales of how brilliant we all were. And now we find ourselves dying in the desert. What? How did this happen to me? How did I end up here? And then he says, has the Lord called us three kings together only to deliver us into the hands of Moab? Now, these are religious people living in a religious time. And I use the word, uh, the R word in its proper sense. Uh, these are people who believe that there's a supernatural world that somehow controls and influences the natural world. 
And being as how that's the sort of men they were, they unsurprisingly blame God for the situation that they are now in. And for a religiously minded person, this is, of, uh, this is uh, you know, I think, often a logical thing to do. Uh, we don't blame God when good things happen to us, uh, when everything's working out well, but we're very quick to blame, blame him when circumstances become disagreeable. For example, when there's an earthquake and thousands of people are killed and billions of dollars of damage is done, we call that an act of God. But when something correspondingly positive happens in the world, we tend not to give God a mention. Now that's neither right nor wrong, that's just a fact. Uh, so here are these deeply religious people, deeply in trouble, and their natural inclination is to say, God must have been the one who made this happen. God must have been the one to bring all this trouble into our lives. At this point, one of the kings, a man called Jehoshaphat, remembers who he is and what he believes. Just to give you a little bit of background, the biblical story of the kings is a bit like Game of Thrones in that there are lots of characters and none of them are all that great. In fact, most of them are pretty bad. And even the ones who aren't, even the so-called heroes of the story, the people who you want to like and try to like, even they have a dark side. To be a good person in this story is to be a person with lots of issues that are quite embarrassing. Um, and this, this character, Jehoshaphat, falls very much into this latter category. On the one hand, he's done some things in his life that are pretty good. And on the other hand, he's done some things in his life that are pretty bad. However, in this moment, he's having one of his better days. Because in this moment of death-threatening thirst, he remembers the God of his fathers and the God of his childhood. He remembers that this God knows what his people are going through and that this God is able to help those people go through it. And in this moment of remembering, he says, is there no prophet of the Lord here through whom we may inquire of the Lord? Now it seems to me that we're all perfectly content and perfectly able to get on with life on our own. But when we come to the end of our abilities and hit a brick wall, and find ourselves in a situation that seems impossible, there's that phrase we use, isn't there? All we can do now is pray. All we can do now is pray. Up until now we had options. But now that we don't have options, all we can do is pray. And presumably at this point, God is in heaven going, yes. I was hoping I'd get picked. <laughs> no one ever picks me. I'm like the clumsy kid who always gets picked last. Now I get to play. I love playing so much. It's presumably how it works. So when uh, uh, jo Jehoshaphat asks, is there anyone here who knows anything about how we can get in touch with God? An officer of the king of Israel answers, well, Elisha, son of Shaphat, is here. So these three kings, even the good king Jehoshaphat, are so far out of touch with what's right they don't know who works the God dust anymore. They don't know through whom or how they can get connected with this God, how they can receive comfort and guidance from him and wisdom and, and all that. And in that regard, we should probably speak positively of pain. It's probably fair to say that when life presses you into a corner where you are then forced to think about who you are and who God is, that corner is good. Because in it, you often discover that you're willing to trust something much bigger and, and much further beyond yourself. Our faith, remember, is not a set of propositions that we try. It's a set of propositions that we trust. I'm not trying Christianity. I'm not giving Christianity a shot and see how it all works out. I'm trusting it. And that trust is particularly meaningful when everything falls apart and you don't know what else to do. Which is sometimes why the lowest point in your life can be the most important point in your life. 
because it can be the turning point, the point where you discover or rediscover who you are and what you value and what importance you attach to the things you believe. Enter stage left, Elisha, the man through whom God will help the three thirsty kings. Now at this juncture, Elisha is at the start of his career as a prophet. Also by way of background, the prophets in the Bible uh, are, are strange men. They're men who believe they were touched in some way by the divine God, spoke through these men and sometimes acted through these men. And in the story of the kings, all of that speaking and all of that acting is very much on the weird end of the scale. It's difficult to understand. It's, it's odd. For example, not long before this episode, Elisha is walking along somewhere and a bunch of teenagers start to make fun of him because he doesn't have, he's, you know, he's, he's bald uh, and, 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 well, if you're going to laugh, please sit on the back because it's a little insensitive, I think, I have feelings um, as well. Um, actually, they said he was bald and fat, thank you. Um, <laughs> So right, this, this strange biblical character is walking along and uh, these teenagers say, hey, you're bald, look at you, you've got no hair. And Elijah works his God magic thing and, and, and some bears come out from a bush and eat the kids. <laughs> and the fact that you find that funny means that you're just as weird as the Bible. Right? Like that's in the Bible, you should read it. It's strange, really strange. So anyway, uh, verse 12, Jehoshaphat hears about this this strange prophet person, and he says, yeah, that sounds good. That sounds like it might work. He, he's just so weird, he just might be onto something. And then Jehoshaphat uses this phrase, the word of the Lord is with him. This is the great phrase of the, the Old Testament. This is the great belief of the Hebrew believer. Our God is a God who speaks. Today, in the moment of our crisis, today, when we find ourselves in this difficult corner, God will speak. And in the Bible, for God to speak is for God to act. It isn't for God to, to use words. It is for, it, it is for God to, to do something. The first page of the Bible, for example, is full of this, this stuff. Uh, it's, it's, the, it's the chorus line of page one of the Bible. Vayomer Elohim, Vayomer Elohim, Vayomer Elohim, Vayomer Elohim. God spoke, and then there was. God spoke, and then something happened. God spoke, and then events changed. God spoke, and then I got help. God spoke. Then things turned around for me. As Christians, we do not believe that God is absent from his creation or from our lives within it. Quite the contrary. We believe that he is involved. He is involved. That today is always the day when help can come. And things can turn around. And stuff can get better. Today is always that day. So with an expectation of getting such help immediately, the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat and the king of Edom went down to him, quite excited, I suppose. God's going to speak. Things are going to change. God's going to speak. We're going to get water. So this is Elisha's big moment, right? This is his big day. He's a newly minted prophet and in the book of the kings, this is what the prophets do. They speak to kings. They help kings. This is their job. So this is his moment, right? This is his chance to shine. And they come and they ask him for help. They ask him for the word of the Lord. And Elisha says to the king of Israel, Why do you want to involve me? Why don't you go talk to the prophets of your father and the prophets of your mother? Now, on reflection, that's probably not the best thing he could have said. <laughs> Clearly, Elisha needs to take a lesson or two in the fine art of faking it. <laughs> what he's saying here is, there's no point talking to me because 
you know, I don't really like you, and you and I speak a different language. I speak for God, you have other gods, why don't you go and talk to them? You've got the wrong number, don't waste your time. I'm not going to help you, I'm going to be over here having a sandwich. Because today I'm French. And the king of Israel says, no, 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 no. Yeah, uh, yeah, for sure I've got my own gods and I've got my own things going on in life. But, 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 but it's, it's, it's the Lord I'm talking about. When he uses the word Lord, he means uh, God as in the God of the Bible, as opposed to all the other gods that he's into. So he says, no, Elisha, I haven't got the wrong number. I haven't come to the wrong guy. I've come to you because it's your God who messed me up. It's your God who, who's, who's to blame for me and my army dying in the desert. It's your God who called us three kings together to deliver us into the hands of our enemy. And, and therefore, it's, it's his fault we're in this mess. And once again, it's funny, isn't it, how, how God gets so little of the credit when things are going good and so much of the blame when things are going badly. In fact, it's funny how God gets the blame when things are going badly, even though the reason things are going badly is because we ourselves have made bad decisions. Neither of these three kings were interested in God seven days ago when they set out for war. They were interested in money. God didn't come into it. But now that they're about to die and everything's gone wrong, well, obviously, it must be God's fault. So that's what they say. And Elisha, he's just one of those guys who can't let it go. Do you know what I mean? Do you ever find yourself, someone says something and you should let it go, but you can't? Um, so, you know, that's where he is. And so his bad attitude gets worse. I suppose you have days like that too, right? Where you wake up with a bad attitude and it just gets progressively worse throughout the day. Um, that'll be tomorrow, I suppose. Um, so Elisha says, As surely as the Lord Almighty lives, whom I serve, if I did not have respect for the presence of Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, I wouldn't even pay any attention to you. In other words, you're nothing to me. You're not even the dust on my shoes. If it wasn't for this guy who I quite like, not all that much, I wouldn't even give you the time of day. So in a nutshell, here's what's going on. Three kings have come to him for help. The help that they're looking for is very specific. They're looking for the word of the Lord. They want Elisha to hook them up with some guidance, some comfort, and some practical assistance. But Elisha's not playing because he's got his grumpy pants on. <laughs> he's not doing it. <clears throat> Interesting, therefore, that with his appallingly bad attitude and with his grumpy pants pulled up firmly around his midriff, he should then say, But bring me a harpist. What? <laughs> I'm, sorry, I'm sorry, what? Did you? You want a harp. Okay, so here's what's going on, right? Everyone's about to die in the desert, buddy. And we're asking you for help, and you want some mood music. And not just any old mood music. No, that's not good enough for you. You want a harp. This is the ancient equivalent of Van Halen asking for a bowl of M&Ms in his dressing room with all the brown ones taken out. I'll take the gig, but you've got to bring me a harp first. I'm not doing nothing until I get a harp. Um, weird, right? Told you. Um, but weirdness aside, notice this. He is at least willing to help. And I think that it's precisely because he's not feeling it, and because he's in a bad mood, and because he's got his grumpy pants on, that he's asking for the mood music, right? He's in a bad mood. He's grouchy. He's got a huge attitude with the situation. He is not feeling any of this. But nonetheless, he's going to do it anyway. And I would suggest to you that this is success. This is when you know you're on the right track to something. Uh, sometimes you have to do it, even when you're not feeling it. And that's good counseling right there. That's worth getting out of your bed for this morning just to hear this. Sorry you don't feel like it, but tough. You have to do it anyway. 
You can't restrict the doing of the right thing to the times when you feel like it. Because most often, doing the right thing matters most when you don't feel like it. Those are the times that count. Those are the times that make you stronger and better and more than you were yesterday. Doing what's right even when it's tough. Doing what's right even when you don't want to. So he gets his harp, right? And I like to think his bowl of deep-browned M&Ms as well. And while the harpist was playing, you can barely imagine this scene, um, the hand of the Lord came on Elisha, right? So this is the moment, quite literally, of the muse. Uh, by the way, this is not what this is about, but it's worth saying that the music has the ability to do something, doesn't it? Can you imagine life without music? Can you imagine driving without music or cooking without music or you know, going to the gym without music? Um, I'm not sure I entirely understand how the connection between music and us works. In fact, I certainly don't understand it, except to say that when I work, I listen to music. And the music that I choose to listen to is chosen on the basis of the work that I'm doing. For example, before Christmas, when I was doing our series on pain management, I did that whilst listening to country music. Because, yeah. Right? Perfect. Perfect. Because country music has this ability to connect you with the pain of life, right? There's something about a song that, you know, you know, daddy left my mum because he loved his tractor more or something, right? It's, <laughs> It just connects you with the pains of life. Uh, conversely, when I'm at the gym, um, which I haven't been to in a while right enough, but um, you know, I listen to Sabaton and ACDC and all that, because it just, it, it just helps, it just does something. It, it connects you to whatever, I'm not sure I get it, but there you go. Um, and Elisha feels that he can, he can get an insight into what God might be saying, and he can tune out his bad attitude, and his, you know, he can get rid of his grumpy pants, and he can just listen to the music. So, so, so the music is playing, and the muse comes on him, and he's doing his thing. I don't know how he's doing his thing, but God is somehow talking to him, and the three thirsty kings are watching. They're watching. And they're watching quite hopefully, because they know that very soon, through the prophet, God is going to speak. And for God to speak means that God is going to act. God's going to do something. They're going to get the help that they need and everything will be okay. So this is like the magic equivalent of the eight ball. Right? Do you remember these when you were a kid? Remember these? Yeah? yeah? It's like a ball you shake and it gives you an answer at the bottom. It's quite simple. So, will I get the girl? You know. Check again. <laughs> Check again. Still no, right. Okay, um, should I stop at Holy Burger on the way home after church? Should I have done a sponsorship deal before I said that? Should I invest in Bitcoin? Right. That's kind of how this, slightly flippant way of how this is working. And When we talk, when we talk about, about what God's will for our life might be, we're often talking about our desire for God to map out our lives in that kind of detail. And the logic is, is almost flawless. Right? We want to live the best life that we possibly can and, and, and we want that with all sincerity and, and we want God to tell us how. And our wanting is quite specific. Uh, who should I date? What's, what job should I do? Uh, should I invest in Bitcoin? How can I move my life to the next level? And I've always admired the sincerity of that but never the logic. Because it's a mistake to think that God maps out our life in that detailed way. Discerning what God wants out of the detail of our lives is by definition difficult. It involves huge chunks of mystery and guesswork and an awful lot more legwork 
than we care to admit. And I mention the legwork because as these three kings see Elisha come to the end of his session with the harp or with the magic eight ball, they're hoping that it's going to work like this, that Elijah's doing his thing and he's going to turn it to the bottom and, oh, you're going to get water. It's all going to work out for you. So Elijah stops shaking the eight ball, right? The music stops. And he turns up and he looks at the kings and the kings are ready to hear what they want to hear. And Elisha says to them, this is what the Lord says. Make this valley full of ditches, baby. <laughs> ditches everywhere. <laughs> Can you check again? <laughs> like, really? Because you see, here's the thing. We're in the desert. And what we need is Water perhaps some soft drinks. What we don't need to be doing right now is to be digging some ditches. I was in Vegas a few years ago and, uh, um, and I was, you know, it was one of those days that you get down there that's, that was hot, you know, the kind of hot that as soon as you step outside the air-conditioned hotel you can feel yourself begin to die. You know, that kind of hot where, 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 where not only walk, is walking difficult but standing is difficult. Breathing is difficult. You can feel your bodily functions begin to shut down. And I was walking up the road slowly, starting to die. And, um, and there were these guys, these Mexican guys, right, in a ditch, digging with, like, shovels and stuff. And, and I'm dying just watching them, and they're digging. Imagine how you feel if you're in this story. What I want to hear right now is that God's going to give me some water. What I don't want to hear right now is that I have to dig ditches or indeed do anything at all. You see, I'm tired, mate. I've been looking for water for seven days. I've been looking perfectly. I've been doing everything perfectly. And I'm done. And you asking me to dig a ditch, this is a lot more than I can be handling right now. So, landing it all somewhere in our lives. What is this strange story? What might it mean this week for you and for me? In your desire, great desire, to move on from second best, to, to, to stop plodding along and do more than that, to, to, to live life far more fully than you're currently living it, here is the truth that I think you don't come to church to hear, but it is the truth nonetheless. God isn't a shortcut. Faith isn't a lottery ticket. Faith is a work order. It's often got more to do with holding a shovel than it does with getting on your knees. You want to have some rain? Fair enough. First you dig a ditch. You want God to help you with your finances? Fair enough. Get a budget. You want God to help you with your health? It's great. Join a gym. You want God to help you with your grades at school? It's awesome. Study. You'll find it helps. <laughs> you want God to make you a good musician? I'm so for you. I'm so for you. Practice makes a difference. Do you know what the Bible says about this? It says that faith without works is dead. To have faith without being willing to do something is useless. It's a waste of time. The nature of faith is always to get beyond being inspired to do something and inspired to believe something and to move into participating in what you would like to do and what you would like to achieve and what it is you actually believe. Um, if you don't move, God won't move. If you don't do something to move on from second best, God won't do it for you. That's not how it works. Uh, Jesus, remember, he, he, he often let people participate in their own, in their own uh, healings. There's that strange story in the Gospels where there's this guy with a 
shriveled hand. So his hand doesn't work. His hand is here somewhere. And Jesus walks up, and, and, the big, and the big picture is that Jesus is going to heal his hand and make it better. But the first thing that Jesus says to him is, stretch out your hand. Why is that necessary? Well, surely Jesus can do it any way he likes. But he chooses not to. He chooses to ask this fellow to participate, to join in, to take part. There's a big difference between getting inspired about something and being willing to participate in that something by faith. Getting a dream for a better, bigger, more fulfilled, interesting life is, as, as you do at this time of the year is, is good. But it's just a dream without you getting off your backside and doing something about it. This is the pattern of God. So the lesson of this is that you should not expect God to send rain until you start to dig the ditches. So homework for you this week. Um, what, think about what it is you want. Like right now in your life, what do you want God to do for you? What's your big ask? What do you need? And having figured that out, then follow it up by asking yourself, well, what ditches can you dig to move your life in that direction, to help make it happen? God will help you. He will. But you've got to help yourself too. That's how it works. Then the rain came. The writer says, for this is what the Lord says, you will see neither wind nor rain, yet this valley will be filled with water, and you, your cattle, and your other animals will drink. This is an easy thing in the eyes of the Lord. And when you've had enough, he will also deliver Moab into your hands. You'll go home with, with the treasure and the glory and the money. It's all going to work for you. And the next morning, about the time for offering the sacrifice, there it was. Water flowing from the direction of Edom, and the land was filled with water. Now what's interesting about this last sentence is that there's no mention of how hard it was to dig the ditches. And I think that the reason for that is that the success is always greater than the pain. When you've been digging a ditch because you want water, and then you get water, all you care about is that you've gotten the water. Right? Remember at the end of last week, you were talking about your business and you said that uh, you know, you've asked the people who work for you to imagine how they're going to feel when they get the, the thing that they want to get. Imagine how it's going to feel. Well, I imagine how it feels whenever you get the thing you want to get. It outdoes the pain and the sacrifice of whatever it is you had to do to get it. So don't be tired of digging. Keep digging ditches. Keep digging ditches. Keep digging ditches. And you'll get there in the end. Yes, we do have time for a question. <laughs> Any questions? Yes. Uh, uh, no, the, um, the <coughs> desert in the Bible is, it is it's, it's, it's a place of, <coughs> it's a place of two things at the same time. So to talk about being in the desert or the wilderness in the Bible is to talk about being in a place where you really don't want to be, and yet it's also to talk about being in a place where you discover things about yourself and about God that you wouldn't have discovered had you not been in that place where you didn't want to be? And is that not the nature of life? Have you not discovered for yourself that sometimes life takes you to a place where you really don't want to be, where you would never have chosen to go, and yet in that difficult place, you nonetheless discover things about yourself and things about God and things about life that you would never have otherwise discovered. Difficulties aren't always bad. Good question. Any others?
Is that feet? Are the feet asking questions? Yeah. Okay, good. So thank you for that, and uh, thank you for the way you listen Sunday by Sunday. Thank you for coming here on honeymoon, even. And um, <laughs> you, <laughs> amazing. Um, you really are a pleasure, a pleasure to teach. Um, I think that part of the reason why I'm able to teach the Bible uh, as well as I think I do is is because you you listen um, the way that you do, and I I love that. That said, I wonder.